Good morning, myself is Dr. M. Chitra, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Physics in Sri Ramakrishna Engineering College, Coimbatore. I have been nominated for the prestigious IAPT Dinabandhu Sahu Memorial Award for this year 2023 from my institution. I am very happy to introduce myself as Chitra and my hometown is Coimbatore. I did my schooling in Trijanarthana Matriculation Higher Secondary School in the Coimbatore district. I completed my undergraduate in physics in Women's Christian College in the year 2004 and I did my postgraduate in physics in Manormaniam Sundarnar University in the year 2006. I am very happy to share that I have been the university gold medalist both in my UG and in my PG under Manormaniam Sundarnar University. I completed my MPhil in the same university in the year 2007. I started my research career in the year 2011 and my research domain includes nanomaterials for gas sensing applications. During my research work, I have participated and presented in various conferences, both national and international. One memorable conference which I would like to share with you is the Solid State Physics Symposium organized by the Department of Atomic Energy. So it was held in MIT University, Noida in the year 2015. I participated and presented my work as a poster. It has been recognized by the Department of Atomic Energy in that symposium and that symposium provides me a gateway to initiate my research collaboration with Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research in Kalpakam in the year 2015. I completed my doctoral degree in the year 2016 under Anna University Chennai and since 2015 till now I am continuing my collaborative research work with IGCAR Kalpakam. And I am very happy to state that I have cleared the Tamil Nadu state level eligibility test for lecturership in the same year 2016. And my passion is not only research but also teaching. So the inspiration for me to take this teaching as my profession or my parents. My parents are higher secondary school teachers. The first inspiration especially is my father for making me to take this profession as my career. Next, I would like to recall my chemistry teacher in higher secondary school who is yet another role model for my teaching profession. So I, so, I started my career as a lecturer in James College of Engineering and Technology in the year 2007. So, from career advancement, I shifted from James College to Sri Ramakrishna Engineering College and since 2008, I am serving, I am having 14 years of experience in teaching and 12 years of experience in research. So since 20, 2008, I have been handling to around 3600 plus engineering students of various uh, domain which includes mechanical, computer science and engineering, information technology, biomedical engineering, civil engineering, robotics, artificial intelligence and data sciences, biomedical and mechanical students. So I have been handling various courses such as applied physics, material science, biophysics, biomaterials, nano and quantum physics, nano and smart materials, essentials of quantum physics related to the particular engineering domain I am handling for the first year students of engineering program. I am also handling the open elective courses offered by the department of physics such as solar technology and non-conventional energy resources to the third year students. I am also an expert in conducting the brainstorming sessions in the placement classes for the students who opted the core companies with physics domain. So teaching is a lifelong learning process. I am constantly upgrading my knowledge by undergoing NPTEL courses. Every semester I am taking two minimum of two NPTEL courses. So far I have completed 13 NPTEL courses and secured elite and toppers. And I am not only in enriching my knowledge through NPTEL courses, I am also motivating my students to undergo the NPTEL courses. Few students have also completed NPTEL in the first year itself. And I am also happy to share that I am upgrading my new emerging fields by undergoing training programs in quantum computing and quantum entanglement which was organized recently in the year 2022 by Indian Institute of Technology Madras in association with IBM. Really that training program motivates me, helps me a lot to motivate my computer science students to upgrade their knowledge and take the profession towards quantum entanglement. I am happy here that in our department, I am very much uh, eager to concentrate on organizing the 
programs, uh, conferences and uh, student centric activities which was funded by DST, DRDO and TNSCST. And overall, I am very much happy to state that in all my administrative work which was assigned to me by my department and by my institution, I am fortunate enough to work as a team. I am very happy to meet you all students again in this forum. Hope you all are fine and healthy by God's grace. Today we are going to look into the basic physics principles for device applications, right? So in my 1990s when I was in childhood, we use many electronic gadgets too. You also you are also using nowadays electronic gadgets in your home, right? So we used tube lights, incandescent bulbs for lighting the houses. So under those incandescent bulbs, we can't be able to sit and study for a very long period. So it happened in 1990s. So scientists think over it and they replace those bulbs by means of the LEDs which nowadays lits in this 21st century. Everyone is using LED as uh, in these street lights we are using LEDs. In uh, dis digital display devices we are using LEDs in airports as well as in the uh, railway stations and so on. And you are using it, is, it for the lighting of uh, functions and so on. So, as a student of electronics and communication engineering, you should know the basic physics principle behind the working of an LED. So now we are going to see how an LED works, right? So before looking into that, we should know the basic materials which are employed in the fabrication of an LED device, right? So what you are going to do is, now we can see what is L and E and D stands for, right? So what is L stands for here? It is light which you all know. So light is an electromagnetic wave. It consists of packets of energy which is called as quanta and the energy of the uh, quanta is equal to photon which is the E equal to H nu, right? And what is meant by this D? This is your diode, D-I-O-D-E. Di means you will be having two types of two different types of materials. So here we are using two different types of materials. One is the P type material, another one is N type material. That is, we are going to use the semiconducting materials for the construction of an LED device. So you all know what a semiconductor is, right? How it works and how it is used for LED. So what are the constituents of an atom? It consists of protons and neutrons which is present inside the nucleus and the electrons are revolving around the nucleus in the orbits, right? And the number of electrons present in each orbit depends upon the formula 2 n square, right? So in the first shell, if n is equal to 1, you will be having 2 number of electrons and in the second shell, you will be having n is equal to 2 means you will be having 8 number of electrons and so on. But what we need to stress over here is the number of electrons which is present in the outermost shell of an atom is called valence electron and that particular shell is called as valence shell. So these valence electrons occupy the valence band of any energy level diagram. So the electrons are said to be in the bound state in the valence band. Unless otherwise it requires get some external energy, it will be in the bound state. Once it gets the external energy, it moves to the conduction band as free electrons. So these free electrons will be responsible for the conducting property of the material. Why we are saying over this is there is a gap between the bottom of this conduction band and the top of this valence band. So this gap is called as your energy gap. So based on this energy gap, we are classifying the materials as semiconductors, conductors and insulators. So if you are looking over here, the gap between this bottom of this conduction band and top of the valence band will be very large for an insulator and it is very much small for a conductor and it is zero for superconductors, good, and it is in between for a semiconducting material. So this band gap can be tuned by applying external temperature or we can be able to tune the band gap of this material by adding some external foreign atoms, right? So hence this apart from using insulators and conductors, we prefer semiconducting materials for the device applications especially in LED fabrication, right? So 
this semiconductors we can classify it as intrinsic semiconductor and extrinsic semiconductor. So, intrinsic semiconductor is a pure form of semiconductor. If you look into there are the basic examples for semiconductors are silicon and germanium. We all know the total number of electrons present in the silicon is 14 good. The number of valence electron which is present in the silicon is 4. So, what happens here is each valence electron of this silicon atom forms covalent bonding with the valence electron of the neighboring silicon atom. So, these uh, intrinsic semiconductor unless otherwise at 0 Kelvin it simply acts as the insulator, but we need to make it as a conducting material we need to alter the conducting property of this material. So, for that we are adding the external foreign atom. So, silicon is a tetravalent material if we need to have more number of electrons we need to add a pentavalent material to get n type semiconductor. If we need to have majority charge carriers as holes we need to add a trivalent impurity to this uh, tetravalent silicon atom. So, what we are preferring to get a n type semiconductor is silicon we are having 4 valence electron we are adding P stands for phosphorus, phosphorus is a pentavalent impurity. So, automatically what happens each valence electron of phosphorus atom forms covalent bonding with the valence electron of the neighboring silicon atom. So, 4, 4, 4 will get clubbed and the one electron will the fifth electron will be set as free. So, if you are adding 100 phosphorus atoms you will be getting 100 free electrons unless otherwise we still know we are not adding any uh, changing the temperature at all we are having 100 free electrons. So, majority charge carriers becomes electrons in the case of an n type semiconductor. Similarly, we need one more type semiconductor for the LED fabrication which is p type semiconductor. So, for that what we are doing we are either adding boron or indium or aluminum or gallium which is a trivalent element. So, automatically what here it forms is the 3 valence electrons of boron will form the covalent bonding with the silicon atom and the fourth electron of silicon is having the pair only with this holes. If 100, 100 boron atoms are added to this uh, semiconducting material you will be having 100 holes. So, in the case of p type semiconductor the majority charge carriers will be holes. So, what we need to stress over here is in the case of n type semiconductor you will be having the majority charge carriers as electrons and in the case of p type semiconductor the majority charge carriers will be holes. The electrons will be more in number in the case of n type and holes will be more in number in the case of p type semiconductor. So, if we fabricate this over a substrate what happens here is the majority charge carriers which is present in the n type semiconductor which are electrons move towards this p type as well as the majority charge carriers of p type which are holes started move towards this n type since they are oppositively charged. After a particular period of time what happens here in this particular region more number of electrons will be formed near the p type semiconductor. So, actually what it starts to do is it starts repelling the further entry of electrons from n region to the p region. Similarly, the holes will form over here near p type region and this holes will further reduce the entry of holes from p to n. So, automatically there occurs a barrier in between this p type and n type. So, this is called as your depletion region. So, in this depletion region the charge carriers are said to be immobile charge carriers. The charge carriers will not move at all. If you need now, those, those charge carriers to be moved we need to give some extra triggering. So, unless otherwise I will give I give you tests or assignments you cannot be able to read and uh, take home, home assignments so on so on. So, some triggering some external force is needed to make those uh, brain to be active. Similarly, we are going to make this immobile charge carriers to be active by giving external biasing. So, you all know what the biasing is it is an external supply right. So, this external supply what we are doing is if p type semiconductor is connected to the positive terminal of the battery and n type semiconductor is connected to the negative terminal of the battery it is called as forward biasing. 
So, what happens in this case is the forward biasing makes those charge carriers which are present in this, this is actually your p type and n type, this is the representation of a diode which represents an arrow mark with a vertical line and we are able to see here the depletion region in which immobile charge carriers are found and if you are applying the voltage what happens in the previous slide the depletion region with this more. In this slide after biasing the depletion region with region becomes narrower. What is the reason behind it? This repulsion this immobile charge carriers starts to be pushed towards the respective regions. This is positive terminal which repels the holes automatically the holes which are formed in this barrier is starting moving towards this n type region. Similarly, this uh, negative terminal of the battery will start to repel the electrons and which formed as a barrier near p region will start to move towards the p type. So, now what happens here is there is a minority carrier injection in the p type semiconductor and n type semiconductor. You are applying voltage constantly and when that applied voltage is equal to or greater than this potential barrier voltage. You are having a potential barrier in between P and N no. So, if you are applying the voltage which is greater than or equal to that potential barrier automatically there occurs a recombination of electrons and the holes electrons from the conduction band and holes in the valence band. Automatically the recombination of transition of electron from higher energy to the lower energy liberates light. So, thus an LED is being blown. So, this is the basic principle behind the working of an LED, right. So, you will be also having a hands on session during the afternoon. So, what we will be doing is you will be provided with a breadboard, you will be provided with the 9 volts battery and you will be provided with this uh, resistance and uh, this one uh, LED will be given to you and you can take down the circuit diagram and you can implement over there, right. This circuit is only a basic circuit which you can club with two more circuits and you can extend it for water level indicators, burglar alarms and so on. So, this circuit we can have in the hands on session, take down the circuit in your notebook and uh, one more thing is so far what we have learnt is what is an LED, what it is made up of. The principle behind LED is injection luminescence, right. So, based on the topic what we have learned today, I have posted a quiz in the Google classroom. Kindly attend the quiz before uh, 5 pm today and uh, it, the marks will be awarded after 5 to 5.30. So, you can examine the marks and you can see the applications of uh, next optical devices in the next class, right. As a part of academic activity in our college, a very good proper mentor mentee system is prevailing in our campus. So, each faculty is allotted with 20 students, myself being the faculty for the first year students of the undergraduate program. So, it is a very challenging situation because the students are from various backgrounds, rural, urban, Tamil medium students, vocational group students are there. So, it is a challenge for me to handle those students and make them to mingle with the peers. So, from day one onwards we handhold them at all situations, once in a week we are having one to one mentor mentee interaction with them. So, during the mentor mentee interaction initially we gather the information related to their family, educational background, economic background and so on. So, if I am able to identify a Tamil medium student, I constantly call him or her or him to my room and make him to motivate him to speak in English. So, one such student which I can remember here is Mr. Gopalakrishnan of 2008 batch. He is actually a Tamil medium student, he is from a village background. So, he feels very shy in communicating with English to their friends. So, I asked him to come and meet me during lunch breaks, during free times. So I motivated him constantly to speak with in English with his friends. So, though English may be right or not, he supported me, he cooperated with me and he developed his communication skill. So, now after that he has been elevated as a project leader in National Aeronautics Lab. As well as this is, these are the steps I am undergoing for the Tamil medium students. For vocational group students, they even do not know the basic physics concepts. So, extra time and extra care has been taken to understand the basic physics terms so that they can be able to come out and uh, make um, compete with their peers. And we are able to identify through this mentor mentee interaction the hidden talents in them. 
So some students may be interested in co-curricular activities, some students may be interested in extracurricular activities, sports, fine arts and so on. So we, I motivate those students to take part in the competitions which are organized by associations, clubs, fine arts clubs, both inter-college as well as intra-college events, right? In science association us, I am motivating the students to nurture their creative ideas so that they can be able to come out with mini projects and those mini models has been executed as devices by using the idea labs and open innovation labs during the first year itself. So automatically this helps them to compete in hackathons and ideathon contests in the subsequent semesters. On online platform too, one student, Mr. Mr. Akash from Aeronautical Engineering has been participated in ideathon contest and bring laurels under my ABLE guidance. So I am very happy to share that during pandemic it is really, it was really a very challenging situation for every faculty office because the students have many distractions during the pandemic situation. So to make them to be attentive in the class, we used active learning methods like quizzes and Kahoot portals and video presentations, seminars were given to them to make them to have the attention in online classes. Next I would like to share with respect to students induction program. So as per all India Council for Technical Education, that is AICTE, or college as a student pro induction program coordinator, I am engaged in conducting three weeks induction program since 2018. So in that students induction program, we are having a session related to human values, universal human values. So that has to be handled by ACTV, ACTE certified UHV mentor. So I am also a ACT certified UHV mentor and I am also one of the coordinator for UHV cell in our campus. During that UHV sessions, some case studies related to competence, some peer pressure and self-exploration, gratitude have been given to them. So that helps the students to have a smooth transition from school education to collegiate education. And this UHV has also been uh, conducted as the mandatory course since 2020 in our curriculum and most of the students who have undergone this UHV course came and said the feedback to me as uh, to me that the UHV classes were very, very much beneficial to, uh, to strengthen their mental ability. So this has been extended and environmental ethics has been given to them and professional ethics has also been taught to them through various uh, hands-on trainings and so on. And I am also happy to share that I am a member of Board of Studies in Science and Humanities Board. So under this uh, Board of Studies, I work with my senior faculty members. We get the inputs from these stakeholders, from industry personnel, from alumni, from the students, from the parents and we in incorporate all the inputs from the stakeholders for uh, into the syllabus framing. So for example, we have included math lab for during the lab experiments in the physics basic experiments. And also we have modulated some concepts related to quantum entanglement since I had the training with industry personnel in the last year. So this kind of curriculum development was also carried out during my academic work. And I am very happy to share that I am not only a faculty for physics, I, am, I hold the additional responsibility in the photography and painting club, for arts club of SREC. So under this banner, we are conducting various competitions related to photography, video editing, short film making, painting, in order to make the students to explore their hidden talents in them. So after identifying the hidden talents from the students, we are giving constant skill development programs and those skill development programs makes them to explore as professional photographers and our club students are mentored to take the photographs, to cover the photographs of most of our college events. Few students have also taken the profession as photography and cinematography. So really it is a very happy moment when they come over here and express their views with respect to the 4 Arts Club. And I am also happy to state that I am a member of uh, various technical societies, Indian Society of Technical Education and the IAPT too. And I am happy to share here some few achievements so far I have carried out in my career of uh, teaching. So, 
I started my research career, the first achievement which I can share with you is the collaborative research work which has been initiated in the year 2015 when I presented my poster in MIT University, Noida. So, from that six, uh, 2015 till now, I am continuing my research collaboration with IGCAR Kalpakam. So, I am able to explore my research ideas by interacting with eminent scientists in IGCAR Kalpakam till now. So, this results in fruitful publications to a number of six in Q1 and Q2 journals with high impact factor. So, based on this, our college has recognized for this highest cumulative impact factor by giving the faculty recognition award for the calendar year 2022. And I am happy to state that I hold toppers in NPTEL course solid state physics in the year 2017 and hold many elites with silver. And one more thing, as a passionate in teaching, I am not only concentrating on the advanced learners, I am also giving equal importance to the slow learners. After college hours, I am spending my time with slow learners to make the students to understand the concept and compete with the other students too. So, this has been reflected in the results which I usually get more than 90 to 100 percentage during every semester. And above all this, last but not the least, the alumni students after a very long period came over to the department, even though we have hand, I have handled the first year only, they come over here and express their gratitude and express their learning outcomes, what they have gained from me. So, this is the main important happy moment which I would like to share with you. And as a nominee from Sri Ramakrishna Engineering College for this prestigious IAPT Dinabandha Sahu Memorial Award, I myself was able to self-explore myself with respect to teaching, learning, curriculum development and pedagogy. So, love physics, to learn physics is the Taraga Mandra which I take out with my profession. Thank you.